Hello, little one. Now, Daddy wasn't very good at history when he was in school, but there's a very important lesson that I've learned and I've not forgotten. That is, history teaches us how we live today and tomorrow and the future. <laughs> it is not the first time we're experiencing a virus in our midst. In fact, we've had many, many, many horrible ones across our history. The Black Death was one of our worst. <sighs> Originating from far away lands, it arrived in 14th century Europe with the help of some very nasty rats. Squeak, 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 squeak. Ah! It killed 25 million people across Europe, wiping out one third of the people. They took two centuries to recover, but it helped shape our modern world. It revolutionized hospitals. You see, back then, Hospitals were only for sick people to rest. Take care, baby. There you go. But they transformed into actual places for medical treatment. Hello. The Black Death also helped to spread the English language. Lower-ranking English teachers replaced the Latin-speaking monks when they all but died in the plague. Achoo! Oh no, oh no. And then, the Spanish flu came. About a century ago, it killed off 100 million people. The aftermath led to many changes. There was a baby boom. Countries also improved disease surveillance and moved towards socialized healthcare. Yay! Today, hundreds of millions of lives are back in danger. By now, everyone knows what COVID-19 is. But what is the legacy of this pandemic? And how have our lives changed? I want to separate fad from future and discover if our brave new world is for better or worse. We've woken up in a new world. It's changing everything from the way we work, the way we eat, the way we greet each other. I'm back to help you make sense of these yes, unprecedented times. I know things are up in the air. But I'm going to tell you how to survive a pandemic. All over the world, our frantic pace of life has ground to a halt. But nowhere is this clearer than in our aviation industries. So what does the future hold for travel? Travel bubbles, perhaps. More security and health checks. And a healthy dose of paranoia. Maybe I should check again. Last year was a boom time for air travel. The industry generated 1.7 trillion US dollars from over 1.4 billion international tourist journeys worldwide. With Singaporean residents accounting for 8.5 million departures. But once the virus hit, even our powerful passport couldn't take us places. Sky travel was officially cancelled. Planes helped spread COVID-19 around the world, and in return, the virus decimated the industry. If you look at satellite flight tracker images, you can see how dramatic this change has been. At one point, 95% of all international passenger traffic ground to a halt. Shukor Yusof has over two decades of expertise in the aviation industry. And he doesn't think mass travel will happen again till 2022. We are stuck with the current situation for the next 18 to 24 months. Until oh. the vaccine is discovered, flying will not be what it is. Wow. It's going to be very health driven. I expect they will want to see a health declaration, either from your doctor or from a health authority 
to show that you are in good health. So in the cabinet, they might cordon off certain rows or sections or, or, or have vacant seats in between passengers, that kind of thing? My view is that that's not going to work because it's very difficult to apply social distancing, even if the middle seat is empty. When someone is behind you, breathing mm -hmm. down your neck, you know, the danger is the things that you're going to touch. The danger would be in lavatories, uh, your food tray and, and also the, the seats, the seat handle, especially when you're in economy class, when you're very much close together. But the way you put it right now, I, I don't feel like I'm looking forward to travelling after this is over. It will be a longer wait at the airport. And it will also cost mm. a bit more in terms of the preparation to fly, as well as ticket prices are probably going to get higher wow. because of uh, uh, social distancing that some airlines are thinking of on board the aircraft. So, future predictions are consigning the glamour days of flying to history. Gloves, masks and social distancing are mandatory at many international airports and masks must be worn on most flights. Some airlines have even suspended meal services, with snack bags being handed out at boarding. But there is a glimmer of hope. The interior of planes have never been known to be hygienic, especially those grubby flip tables. So, in this new age of restricted flying, the top priority is a bacteria blitz. Our surfaces are about to get a serious cleaning. If there's one thing this pandemic has made us more aware of, it's the surfaces we come into contact with every day. Suddenly, we're all obsessed with them. And I don't mean with what we can see. I mean, with what we can't see. The COVID-19 virus can linger on many surfaces. Lab tests show that the virus can remain detectable for up to two days on cloth, four days on glass, and three to seven days on plastic, like keyboards. Prior to the pandemic, the company Dehygienic would only clean offices and retail outlets once every six months. But these days, business is booming. With this uh, COVID-19, because it's such a massive wake-up call for all of us, mm. I believe that this uh, Interest in this infection, it will last for the next three to five years. Okay. Right now, uh, people are treating this infection as the norm. We source out for the latest technology in the world. The goal to it would be uh, electrostatic uh, disinfection. Electrostatic? Yes. This is an electrostatic gun. When I discharge the chemicals, each droplet will be charged electrically. Let's say uh, a 3D sphere. Uh, with conventional methods, when I spray, if I spray the front, mm -hmm. only the front of the spear mm -hmm. will be coated with the chemical. Mm -hmm. But whereas with an electrostatic spray, once I spray, the spray itself will envelope the whole spear itself. So I just have to trust that the chemicals will go to where it needs to uh, go? Not really. We do have uh, test kits available to show the amount of um, germs and viruses on the surface. Uh -huh. Disinfection has become a global buzzword and attention has been focused on how we clean private and communal spaces. But there's still one area that poses the hardest of challenges. Public toilets. So, what are the dirty danger zones? The biggest offender? Flushing the toilet without closing the toilet seat. See, this creates a jump-packed mist. <sighs> Hand dryers are basically germ blowers. Filled with 27 times more bacteria than a single paper towel. And into the mucky mix is the soap dispenser. About a quarter of soap dispensers in public loos are packed with poop particles. And then there are the door handles. These 
are coated with unmentionables. From the women's toilet, yeast. From the men's toilet, ooh. And when you throw in the super infectious COVID-19 into the mix, it's a veritable virus party. Most people want to escape public loos as fast as possible. Not Sarah Bookman. She's got bogs in the brain. And wrote her thesis on adapting toilets to suit different cultural practices. Sarah, in our current design of the toilets, um, there are flaws that this pandemic has revealed, right? What are they? Public toilet design in the current, current state, I think, you can really see what the flaws are in regard to what um, the World Health Organization has said. It's like you use a paper towel to turn off the tap and you use a paper towel to push the door open. And I think when you're relying on things like that, that's what you see as a design flaw because it's not intuitive and you can't trust that everyone's gonna do it. For the future, I'd say let's integrate um, sensors into, into our designs. You open the door by a sensor, you, so you push a tap on by a sensor, you, you flush by a sensor, it's cleaned by a sensor. Maybe a technology where you put your hands down somewhere and they're cleaned and then you walk out. So like contactless toilet use, that's the way to go for future toilet design. The thing that makes these spaces quite um, unsanitary is that they're static places, that they've got corners, that they're, um, that they're really hard to clean, that they're enclosed. So it's thinking about things in design, like could we get walls that retract and as they, as they open and shut around a cubicle, could they have a kind of sensor which cleans them as they do that? So all these things that you've been thinking about, how do we make sure that these things happen? I think public toilets are a really funny thing because either architects are really into designing them to be make, to make them really cool spaces. And then on the other hand, it's like the last thing you think about. But mm. perhaps now the stigma will change. Perhaps now we'll see them more as opportunities of like, of, of, of saving public health. It might be years before we see fully sensor activated public toilets. So until then, maybe this is how I need to gear up when I go to the toilet. Or there might be a simpler solution with this invention. Making sure this is the year we truly went contactless, these hands-free door openers are an inventive way to avoid touching dirty handles, buttons and switches. And with great duress usually comes great ingenuity. The computer, instant coffee, super glue, the humble ballpoint pen, and the mighty jet engine were all invented during World War II. So what new inventions will come out of this pandemic that are going to change the way we live? New habits have appeared along with the virus, and some of them aren't that great. The worst has got to be panic buying. A simple task like going to shop for groceries has become a test of patience and determination and endurance. <laughs> Trying to get all of your items often feels like some kind of contactless contact sport. Wish me luck. The fear of missing out is clearly alive and kicking. And it's not just in Singapore. At the height of the virus panic, here's what some nations put in their trolleys. In Singapore, we bought instant noodles, toilet paper, and household cleaning supplies. But over in the USA, people stocked up on aerosol disinfectants, thermometers, and oat milk. In France, pharmaceutical products bath soaps, cleaning gloves, sausages and pastas were piled into shopping trolleys. While Australians stacked up pasta, eggs, canned meals, laundry products and tea. 
One of the world's most coveted commodities is the face mask. China accounts for 85% of all global production. Demand for hand sanitizer has also soared, with a 1,400% increase worldwide in the first month of the pandemic. This outbreak has taught us that we can't rely on the global supply chain. Because if every country is going through the same disaster, then Singapore will be at the mercy of limited supplies and price hikes. So how can we innovate our way out of this supply crunch? Well, salvation may lie in the humble carrot, cabbage and potato. Professor William Chern has managed to do some serious upscaling. He's turning buckets of scraps into homegrown hand sanitizer. Professor, how did this idea come about? Every day, there will be a lot of leftover vegetables generated at the Pasir Panjang Wholesale Centre. We put these leftover vegetables in a container. And we just add water, bacteria, some salt. And then we just leave it close for up to 20 days. Then we take out a sample to test the antimicrobial activity. Our result shows that the detergent that is coming out of the fermentation is better than the commercially available uh, bio detergent. So is this cheaper than the commercially available ones? In our case, there's no cost. Uh -huh. I think the only cost would be logistics supply chain is something, but it's not at the production level. How can this model be used for production in times of demand? It provides a, a new option for government to think about because in time of need, we know that the uh, supply chain logistic arrangement uh, is, is, is a challenge, right? Because if you have a new option, we can produce our division at the community centre or the NGOs. The beauty of this innovation is that it's simple. It's so simple, it's easy to, to be propagated and adopt, adopted by a different level. This pandemic is triggering profound social and behavioural changes. So, are long-held human habits heading to the historical dustbin? Dr. Samuel Chung studies how different communities respond to the virus. Can things really go back to how they were? And what might change forever? Well, what do you personally foresee after Circuit Breaker? What is the new norm? This has actually yanked us into the new age of technology uh, rather forcefully in terms of public spaces and how we use them. Our behaviour might also change. So, uh, for instance, the closure of certain facilities or the removal of... Uh, the ability to sit and gather at your void decks makes it more difficult for spontaneous and informal interaction. So people might become less attached to these places uh, post-COVID because of the prolonged absence, uh, their behaviour patterns might have changed or they might have just grown more accustomed to online isolation or online interaction with others and see less need for all these public spaces. Do you think that COVID-19 will cause the death of the handshake. I think most of us would eventually come to a stage where we would establish a new norm within our society to say that, okay, we will not go for the handshake, we'll go for something else. Replacing the germ-laden handshake are foot shakes and elbow bumps. But even these put people in close proximity with one another. So for now, bowing at a safe distance might be the best bet. Before COVID-19, I never expected to see empty chairs and empty tables at the hawker centres. And the last thing I expected was to turn to a prepper for tips. You know, while we were all panicked buying toilet paper, they were ready for the imminent apocalypse. So maybe it's time I learned some proper pandemic survival skills. Hi, Michael. Michael is the man who started his own circuit breaker rules in January including in reducing visits with his parents and relatives. So we can probably say he's more prepared for COVID-19 than any of us. You, you don't look like what I envisioned a 
prepper to, to look like, garb down in gear, or maybe even like hiding your identity with a mask or whatever? I started prepping because I volunteered with Singapore Red Cross. And it has provided me with training as in the areas of first aid, psychological first aid, and disaster management. <laughs> you also have it on your cap, actually. Michael Lim, right? Correct. <laughs> so, and my cap, there is actually my name, uh, my blood type, and also whether I have any known drug allergy. Ah. At the heart of Michael's survival strategy is his trusted everyday carry. This bag is actually what I carry every day for work and going home. Okay. This is basically like a sling bag or a heat pouch. So then at the side, I hang my mini first aid pouch. Within this pouch, there's actually uh, roller bandages, one pair of first aid gloves, first aid blasters for minor cut, a triangular bandage, an eye pad uh, in case of eye injury. And then lastly, I have a thermometer. I see. Okay, what, what else do you have in your bag? Some food, some um, hydration uh, items, of course the flashlight. A big pack of baby wipes, land cleansing wipes. Then uh, because I may, may injure ourselves, uh, I do have the salon pass patch as well. So the other item I have, I call it the COVID-19 test kit. About face mask and heat face mask, flat tissue, thermometer, mosquito repellent spray, so this focuses a lot about uh, personal hygiene, uh, protection, uh, protecting yourself against uh, various kind of transmission. How has this pandemic changed your strategies for the future? I would say that the main part of the principles remain. Uh, it's just that we will now see a stronger emphasis on hygiene, uh, on hand hygiene, personal hygiene. The end. So, my little one, in the future, people might look back on our time with COVID-19 and see it as a great turning point in our modern history, when the Earth stood still, when to survive, we threw out so much of our lives that we once thought mattered. It has been a struggle, but it's clear that we've been given a chance to change things for a better future. And that's why it matters.